Okay, um, again, welcome everybody. I think we're gonna get started now. Um, most people are getting here. We've got a good group joining us. Um, hello, I'm Greg Albers. I'm from the Getty in Los Angeles, um, and I'm part of the Mupu Dig team, which is the Museum Publishing Digital Interest Group, um, along with Lauren Macomb from the Art Institute of Chicago, Emily Zoss, the National Gallery of Art, and Katie Riley from the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Um, so uh, four of us have I've started the Museum Publishing Digital Interest Group as a way of sort of joining, bringing the community together and giving us a chance to uh, learn from one another and connect with one another. Um, and we do these bi-monthly calls where we have a chance to hear about new digital publishing projects and initiatives that are going on um, out in the world. And so that's what you all are here for today. Um, I just want to, a couple of housekeeping things at the very beginning. Um, please note, as it was announced when you came in, we are recording. Um, we do make these, these um, calls available on our YouTube channel um, following the calls so that you can come back to them um, or share them with your friends widely and often. Um, so just know that we are recording. Um, I want you to make sure that if you haven't already signed up for Mupu Dig for our mailing list um, and for our Slack group, yeah, we invite you to please do that. You can do that on our website, which is digpublishing.github.io. That's D-I-G publishing github.io and we'll put that in the chat. So if you're not already a member of that, please sign up so you can hear about our um, upcoming events. And again, um, so you can reach out and talk to folks um, in between events and um, learn about what they're doing and, and ask them questions and share your own uh, stories and projects with them. Um, with that, we're gonna jump in and get started. Uh, we're very excited today to have two speakers um, with us today to share two sort of case studies of digital project initiatives that they've undertaken at their own institutions. Um, we're gonna start this morning with Joseph Newland from the Menil Collection. He's the Director of Publishing. He's gonna be talking about their Read Online project and program. Um, and then we'll be following that by, uh, with Jeremy Radke from the RISD Museum, the Rhode Island School of Design Museum, who will be talking about their um, Raid the Icebox Now publication. We're going to have uh, Joseph start and talk for a little bit, and then Jeremy's gonna follow up with that, and then we'll do a sort of joint Q&A at the very end. Um, so please um, jot down your questions as you're thinking of them so you can, you can share them at the very end. Um, for quite the questions and answers time, we invite you to post in the chat, um, and the Mupu Dig will be kind of moderating those to make sure we can get them up in front of Jeremy and Joseph for the Q&A. Or if you'd like, you can also come off mute and feel free to just chime in when we get to that point and, and uh, and, and say it out loud. Um, and with that, without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Joseph Newland to, um, to lead us off for today. Thank you so much. Good morning. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'm here in sort of straightened circumstances because we're in the midst of Tormenta Tropical Beta. You know, um, the Gulf Coast is not very friendly, especially in September and October when it comes to tropical storms and hurricanes. So I'm going to warn you that I'm working on a laptop with a tiny screen and um, marginal bandwidth rather than being in my office with everything I need, including the material I left on my desk that I wasn't able to get to this morning um, over the bayou. So this will be rather improvisatory, but um, it's really great to, to see all of you because of course, so many of us have been um, emphasizing digital lately. At the Manila, when the COVID thing started, since we have to address that at least at the beginning, we did not decide to ramp up anything. So I'm just going to report on sort of what we've done um, and sort of how we think about it. Um, the Manila Publishing Program is rather small. It's just two people. Um, and it's primarily print oriented. The Manil started in 87 and inherited a really strong uh, print publishing program and digital has always taken a back seat. Um, that was just an emphasis on, we're a, I would say we're a medium sized museum with 90 to 105 staff members, not counting um, gallery attendance and security. And we do have a two-person publishing department that is now firmly established. We had a digital content manager when we relaunched the website in 2015, and that person left in 2017 and has not been replaced. So right now it is myself and Nancy O'Connor who is here on the call. Um, and she and I are 
everything digital at the Manil, except for working with Link by Air, who works with our, our website. And we originally decided early on that we would develop about one project a year as an online publication. Um, I talked to Albert Ferrer, who, as you know, at the CCA, if you um, have watched his presentations at Museum Publishing Seminar, um, they've really gone online for a dialogue purposes, but they've also done very interesting e-publications and so forth. And so um, sort of watching what they were doing and so forth, we decided we would do essentially one, um, one a year. So I'm going to go to the read online page at the Manil and um, hope that it seemed, or, or am I on? I can't really see. Did the screen share and has not? There we go. All right. Okay. So um, we have in the in the top nav at the Manil, we actually have buttons. After we did a few, we actually put read online there. And um, if you, it, it aggregates everything. It's got a link to our bookstore there, a history of our print publishing program, um, a number of articles, which um, I'll talk about just briefly after, intro, after introducing them. And then um, our, our main features, which are the two I'll talk about the most. Those were actually um, online specifically. And our whole question there is why does this content want to be digital? If information wants to be free, which which information wants to be digital? So um, we tr we try very hard not to emulate print publications. The the features are a little bit m are much simpler. They're actually able to be done by us at the museum with um, a very simple toolkit that was basically part of our website architecture. We have a number of articles and so forth and. Our model for publishing these is the whole idea was to let younger voices at the museum speak. So we have the digital content manager, now our associate editor, is the head of a small editorial committee. And there's one curator who is not a senior curator. And then we also have three or four people on the committee who are interested in writing, say one from conservation, curatorial, and so forth, so that we um, ideally are able to do a variety of, of, of things there. Um, why, do we, why do we choose to do things digital um, when it comes to, say, the wolf and caribou or recollecting Dogon? Um, obviously, there's timeline that is uh, important. Um, you, of course, you have to realize that they're not necessarily shorter timelines if you're doing a, 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 a major project. Or it does have a shorter production cycle, since I find that editing and design tend to take about the same amount of time, but you don't have printing, shipping, and um, order fulfillment, and so forth. Budget can be about the same, except for print. Um, of course, you can keep it in-house and, and do um, simpler things, or you can do much more complex ones. Um, one of the things we like about it is that they are free to users, um, and, that's, and it increases your reach, of course. So one of the things that when we ask about recollecting Dogon, which is, features our Dogon collection, we wanted it to make it bilingual because it's mostly Malian art, and Mali is a Francophone country. So there was that. We, you have a, obviously a greater scope. We hope that you know, students in Hong Kong, if they get through the Great Firewall of China, and, and Zaire, of course, could, could access this, and then all our usual art centers that we expect. Um, we do expect often to have time-based mediums. Um, so that's, that's one of the reasons that we like it. And then, of course, you can incorporate um, photographs of the installation um, after the show opens or right before it, the very last minute. So I'll start with Wolf and Caribou, which was our first. And the reason we did this one is there was, um, we had the opportunity to work with Yupik Elders. It's uh, a show that featured two Yupik masks. 
And um, we had Yupik elders and Kirling Chuna McIntyre, who is basically a sort of living national treasure in the Arctic circles. And um, he actually uh, remembers a number of things that um, his mother taught him about wolves and caribou. And this, this mat, we have a rollover caption, which obviously is a feature that's very handy. Um, and then we do the, obviously we have our um, navigation up here. And so one of the things, again, that was great about this was we did not expect to have uh, Chuna come when we started. And here he and his, one of his singers is, does actually another performance. So this was actually something that when we started out, we did not expect to be able to incorporate and it became a feature of the publication that's absolutely key. So that's one thing about sort of being able to move fast. And then obviously we would never have been able to do this um, in any, any form of the book. Much, much more like a book as we have the ability to have uh, Andre Breton loading slowly with Yupik masks on the wall behind him. And so basically what this does is it lays out um, both from the, the, the native, sorry, the native point of view and also the art historical point of view, how we can go through. And again, it, it, it gives us the ability to use pictures and text in a way that um, we probably couldn't do. We decided not to link outside of the museum with this one, um, but everything is, um, so. and this was quite simple to produce and we did this in a rather a hurry. Um, Recollecting Dogon, so this launched in December, 2015. And then in February, 2017, we did Recollecting Dogon. And our, this is with our curator who is a Mali specialist and um, he actually put together um, a team of specialists of various sorts. And so for this one, we did commission a lot. Um, but again, you can commission short text, which we found very useful. So essentially, we asked people to write 500 words. And um, again, we, we do have here, we have one of the features, um, an, an artwork that was installed in the gallery. This is a detail of it in the gallery. And one of the authors had actually worked with this artist before. And so she has pictures of the same piece in his, um, in his essentially at his house, obviously the usual art historical background and details uh, with the Malian walls and the Malian dirt. And then we have the pictures in the Manila, which were literally dropped in just as, as we began to launch. Um, again, one of the, things that we really did want to choose at, at this point was we did do a translation um, to reach our francophone audience because I don't know if you've ever talked to anybody about trying to get books into Africa but it's not an easy thing and we felt that because the level the the as long as they ha you have a web connection you would be able to essentially get to this and we would hope that some of the material, some of the more historical material um, would be available there. And again, one of the things that everybody likes, as you all know, is that you can put lots more historical pictures in than you might be able to put in a book. So that um, we, we were able to get access to French archives with public domain material, and we were able to do quite generous um, uh, slideshows of them. So I would invite you to go tool around those. Um, and then as far as our articles, we, will, we, we, we do hope to do one or two, of, one every year or so of our online publishing. Um, we actually have one that's going to be starting up um, next month. And then in our articles, we are reconstituting the editorial committee. And that's something that Nancy and I will be working on just ourselves. Um, one lesson for a small staff, if you're like us, if you want to do a really ambitious project, try to make sure your other projects are not going to invade it. I started an ambitious program on Twombly and music with a European composer and a New York string quartet trying to coordinate it from Houston. And I just literally did not have 
the bandwidth and the time and resources to pull it together with the video that it would need and so forth. And so that became a much more scaled down thing that is going to produce one video of a performance in the gallery. So the lesson there is uh, make your timeline match your resources and of course your budget. So um, I'm happy to take questions and when we talk later. Thank you very much. That's great. That's fantastic. Thanks so much, Joseph. Oh, um, that I think there were there were some questions in the chat that we'll that we'll have for you after the at the okay. end in our Q and A section. Um, and um, but in, before that, I'm going to kick it over to Jeremy Radke, who will be presenting again from the RISD Museum on his Icebox Now publication. So, uh, Jeremy, when you're ready, take it away. Um. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Jeremy Radke. I'm the Assistant Director of Digital Initiatives at the RISD Museum. And before I get started, I just wanted to call out a couple of people. Um, my partner in crime, uh, Amy Pickworth, um, is on the call and she is the Assistant Director of Publications at the Museum. Um, uh, and also I see a couple of people from OOMF who are our um, kind of technology partners um, on all of our projects. Um, so I, for this talk, I kind of want to like zoom out a little bit and talk about not only the what and the how, um, but also the why, <laughs> which might get a little abstract for a second, but I promise at the end I'm going to zoom in and actually talk about the thing that we made. Um, and um, so let me share my screen. Bum, bum, bum. Okay. And you guys can, let me go back. Hold on, there we go. You guys can see that? Cool. All right, so um, for those of you who are not familiar with the RISD Museum, um, we are one of the country's largest academic museums with over 100,000 objects in the collection. Founded in 1877, um, the RISD Museum is woven into a campus of an art and design school. Um, and we are, also the largest museum in the state of the Rhode Island. Um, thus, um, we're accountable not only to students, but general public. Um, um, yeah, but while um, 140 years old, the RISD Museum's history online is much shorter. Um, we only launched our online collection um, in 2013, and it would be generous to say that we had a website before that moment. Um, our path um, forward from that point has been marked with experimentation and peppered with a lot of straight up failure. Um, so I wanted to share um, some of our most recent publishing initiatives and talk about how they connect to our mission um, and vision of our work um, and introduce Ziggurat, our um, new online publishing tool um, and um, kind of share like how some of the workflows um, it supports. Um, so, um, so I want to start by talking about the technology that we're using, which is Ziggurat, which is an open source publishing tool. Um, Ziggurat was uh, built by us um, in collaboration with Oomph Incorporated and um, many people from Oomph again are on this call. Um, um, as museums have steadily embraced digital approaches to exhibitions, um, traditional thinking around publishing, creative production, and collaboration has been wanting, we feel. Um, in keeping with our mission um, as a museum and an art school, the RISD Museum um, was compelled to contemplate innovative new ways in which digital publishing contributes to and expands upon um, exhibition design and how um, creative research and experimentation are integral into um, a design process. Um, and just to be real, um, when we're thinking about publishing, like we have to, um, our our ambitions are always like eclipse our financial abilities and um, we need to make tools and technologies that are designed for the staffing levels of a mid-sized institution. We don't have developers on staff and need to re rely on contractors for that work. Um, and we also need to keep with our identity and center the needs of artists and designers um, in anything that we make. Um, and so to that end, um, we created Ziggurat um, Ziggurat is like an, is a, a flexible system of layouts, uh, typography, spacing, and content that um, uh, can be kind of put, pulled together in unforeseen ways. 
um, knowing that the platform's first publication um, would be generated by artists with Brave the Ice Box Now, which is more on that later. Um, an emphasis was placed on highlighting visual elements, animation, interactive detail, um, and this would allow for contributors to be less encumbered by highly controlled templated designs um, and allow for the platform to be used as a tool and a site for critical and creative production um, and presentation of new bodies of work. Um, some of the other things um, other than Ray the Icebox that we've made um, on Ziggurat are um, our audio tours. Um, we recently, because of COVID, needed to move all 700 um, RISD uh, graduate and undergraduate students um, shows online we, that using um, our publishing tool, um, we are moving our, um, we're exploring like uh, uh, having a, an expansion of our uh, print journals um, um, using Ziggurat um, and also our first publication, um, Right at the Icebox Now. Um, we're working on a more scholarly publication soon. Um, and, um, but um, I just wanted to say that um, technology um, is not the thing that like drives our work. We reject the idea that one mobile app or an, an AR um, gallery walkthrough will solve any of our problems, but investing in all of our resources into expensive interfaces uh, by not doing that, it allows us to find alternative paths to making strong content. Um, technology at its heart is about people and people um, we feel like should be at the center of anything we do. Um, but then technology is also a disruptor. So I asked the question, how can um, technology projects and publishing um, uh, begin to address um, problems inherent in the structures of museums? How can it not reinforce like historic power um, structures like colonialism and elitism and privilege and all the things that we're like um, thinking about, um, especially now. Um, how can it even like confront the idea of the museum as a voice of the the, the voice of authority? Um, the digital space offers new possibilities and pathways for um, addressing this. Um, the RISD Museum was founded on the belief that art artists and the institutions that support them play a pivotal role in promoting broad civic engagement um, and creating more open societies. Um, in 2017, um, we incorporated a new um, interpretive strategy. Experimentation, responsiveness, and reallocating value became a grounding force, particularly for digital projects. Um, introspection, iteration, um, and inviting people in destabilizes previous routines. And in that instability, um, there is creative potential. Um, the relative agility and newness of digital projects provide a good sandbox for experimentation and collaboration, ultimately shifting towards institutional change, which collectively for us is like one of our goals. Um, uh, so what does it mean for a museum to act as a publisher? We still share scholarship, we still have exhibitions, we still have objects, we're still deciding um, in the end what people see and experience with our content. How do you actually confront and challenge the institutional voices of authority? Um, how can digital technology contribute to dismantling rather than reinforcing existing power structures? Um, honestly, I have no idea, um, but through the work, we're beginning to figure it out. Um, and, um, and we do that um, through, um, engaging community-centered centered, um, planning processes with all of our projects um, where we listen and, um, and learn before we build. We embrace, embrace a studio model um, and employ students and interns and grad assistants and fellows and give them leadership roles in making content. Um, and this builds, um, builds into projects a, a, a varied and diverse um, array of perspectives. Um, we speak about our work um, in terms of learning goals, um, which is weird sometimes. Um, and we provide this space for um, and opportunities for artists and designers, um, develop long-term relationships. Um, and um, we also draw on like our uh, art school critique culture. Um, as a museum attached to an art school, we find value in dovetailing with um, art school critique where um, critique is not about criticism necessarily, but um, about being critical and collaborative. Um, and to be collaborative means we invite people in and share stories out. To be critical means we perceive the museum as a material and the outcomes as ambiguous. Um, so um, 
what does this mean? Um, how are we critical? How are we collaborative? Um, uh, I wanted to talk about some of that through this one project, Raid the Icebox Now, um, um, and um, talk about the catalog as an example. Um, 50 years ago, our museum, it's actually really great to present with someone from the Menil because Dominic uh, Menil uh, was instrumental in the initial project 50 years ago. Um, Raid the Icebox One with uh, Andy Warhol, um, which took place in 1970. Um, this exhibition, Warhol presented entire sections of objects as they appeared in storage with little or no regard for their condition, authenticity, or art historical status. Um, as a way to celebrate the an anniversary, one of the first um, examples of the artist working as curator, the RISD Museum engaged eight contemporary artists, art collectives, and designers um, in a three-year process to create new bodies of work and cre um, create a unique curatorial project um, using the museum and its collection as a site for critical creative production and presentation. Um, um, Pablo Bronstein, Nicole Eisenman, um, Pablo Hoguera, Beth Kettleman, Simone Lee, Sebastian Ruth, Paul Scott and Triple Canopy were each given unlimited access um, to our collection and our staff, an exhibition space, and, um, and for our uh, conversation, very importantly, a section in the, our digital publication. Um, uh, unlike a traditional exhibition catalog, the nature of this publication um, offers artists an opportunity to expand their practice and research beyond the physical parameters of the museum's exhibition space. Um, as a result, um, Raid the Icebox Now is an unconventional digital publication that presents original work in the form of essays, artist interviews, um, video and time-based work, um, musical compositions, fiction, soundscapes. It's like a total mess of stuff. Um, and, um, I, and I think that it offers um, new models for digital production. Um, in collaboration within a museum. Um, so each artist was given a chapter and acted as its author. Um, they were assigned um, a content producer um, on our team who worked with them to shape and create um, their projects. This invitation was made um, at the, uh, um, to also initiate the development of Ziggurat. Um, the artist research and the parameters around their projects informed our discovery sessions as we defined our technology. Um, we designed Ziggurat through the challenges that each artist gave our team. Um, and this created a publication and a platform where its content and design were um, generated through experimentation. Um, thus, Ziggurat was shaped by what artists were curious about, what areas of research they wanted to further, what new mediums they wanted to experiment with. And as a result, our work and design process was not geared around specific outcomes, but rather centered around how to use a digital platform as a tool to conduct artistic research and foster experimentation and ask critical questions. Um, and so I thought it would be helpful to kind of like uh, center some of that on the actual work um, that was made. Um, so I wanted to just go through a couple in the time that I have left, which I have 10 minutes left, um, uh, a little less. I wanted to talk about some of the artist projects in the publication itself. Um, and I just wanted to start with Beth Kettleman. Um, <clears throat> the digital publication provides a unique chance to um, expand mediums. Um, and Beth Kettleman, um, is an example of that. Through the support from our creative production team, um, Beth, who typically um, works as a ceramicist, um, collaborated with local performers um, to create a short satirical film uh, that explores the dubious life of the collector Charles um, L. Pendleton, whose collection is represented in the museum's decorative art swing. Um, the final uh, piece serves as an alternative tour for her uh, installation, Game of Chance. Um, and I think I have a trailer from that. Can you guys hear that? Um, 
our team wrote a script, hired actors, ran rehearsals, did costume design. Um, we filmed and directed a production using the museums as a set with Beth um, on site um, for production. Uh, the script referenced Ritzy's museum furniture catalog that dated back to 1904. And the, the format uh, mimicked and poked at like the traditional museum um, narrative. Um, I'm not going to show you any, any more than I already did, but like the tone of it is funny and our museum doesn't really have a sense of humor. So that in and of itself was really like weird for us to work on. Um, and, um, and then the site itself um, kind of like mimics like 90s era, like bad web design. Um, so feel free to explore that. <laughs> Um, uh, Sebastian Ruth. Um, Sebastian is a Providence-based musician um, who composed a two-hour piece that corresponds with the lighting sequence um, of an FAA um, aircraft warning light um, through a series of smokestacks located on the Providence waterfront. Um, our team created a 12-hour overnight time lapse of the lighting sequence um, and um, with Ruth um, and composed um, a, oh, and then he composed a, a new score um, to that sequence. Um, to do this, our, our team sat with the artist on a boat dock overnight, filming the lighting sequence into the early morning hours. Um, there we are. Um, the content for the publication was made before the exhibition and it shaped the actual installation. So the, the publication came first. Um, and Pablo Higuera. Um, Pablo collaborated with a living uh, Latin American artist whose work is represented in the museum's Nancy Sales Day collection. Um, uh, engaging in long form conversations with artists and their families, our team began working with Pablo to help him communicate the domestic lives of artists and, um, and, uh, and the um, relevance of place and home um, where, uh, when, when viewing works in the museum. Um, as part of his research process, our team followed Pablo into people's homes, um, filming the interviews, um, capturing candid conversations, and documenting the domestic settings that the artists um, um, that are represented in the collections actually live in. Um, these conversations um, that we witnessed uh, shaped the exhibition, directly finding their way um, into the installation um, and forming what became um, but, uh, into the installation and, and, and forming what became the digital publication. Um, I'll show a short clip, and actually I have to get out of this to do it, um, of one of those interviews. Um, it, and this is, um, this is Pablo speaking to Liliana Porter um, about some of her work. It was another one, Christ in the cross and was made of sugar to put in the cake for First communion or something, <laughs> like you know. <laughs> so, so these these really important historic or spiritual figures that are transforming to like mere to mere capitalists. Strange, or... strange yeah. objects, strange mm -hmm. weird uh, objects. Uh, you know, I like all these objects. How you know situations or people become these objects? No, mm -hmm. what is representation? Because finally, uh, what really exists is more representation than life. If you think, you know, like objects remain through centuries and people yeah. don't. <laughs> um, so, and you could see actually in this image right here, um, that a lot of what we made for the publication also made its way into the exhibition itself. And we displayed um, a lot of those interviews on that like weird old TV. Um, uh, so um, another person was Nicole Eisenman. Um, it, this is another example where the digital publication was an opportunity to further explore themes found in the artist's exhibitions and find ways to connect to spaces and people beyond um, the museum's walls. Um, Nicole Eisenman provided a prompt to a Providence-based author, Matthew Lawrence, to create a multimedia reading experience that combines original fiction um, combined with a series of video vignettes. 
Um, and our team uh, chose the author, supported his writing process, held casting calls, hired actors, hired pole dancers, scouted a venue, um, filmed and directed um, with um, Matthew. And um, this is another example where the digital publication became an exciting opportunity for artists to expand their practice by making new artwork for a digital space. Um, and um, lastly, I think lastly, nope, one more. Um, Simone Lee. Um, Simone Lee created a new sound work that uses archival research to highlight the voices of women of color throughout history. Um, this piece. Um, titled Chorus, um, features the voice of five Black women, um, including the artist reading um, uh, text uh, uh, and also the, uh, the diary of Nancy Elizabeth Prophet, whose legacy is documented in several collections across the state. Um, Prophet's work um, in particular has become a touchstone for Lee and um, in the digital publication, Chorus um, joins Simone's archival findings, including uh, photographs and diary experts um, by profit, um, images of the sculptures lead selected from the RISD Museum's collection, um, and uh, the primary source text. Um, and, um, uh, and I think I want to show a little bit of that one as well. It was winter when I lived in Paris, studying French at a cultural center for Chinese immigrants. It is the sheet of steel gray sky that I remember the most and the roar of the motorcycle traffic circling the streets where I was living, a former convent that faced Guerre de Lez on the one side and was just a few steps from the Canal Saint-Martin in the other direction. Near the station, just in front of the entrance to the convent, there gathered groups of young Afghani refugees standing around all day. At night, I saw their sleeping bags and makeshift fires lining the canal. But when I asked the Parisian I knew for some explanation of their presence, she said she didn't know what I was talking about. The station and the canal and the motorcycles and the Afghanis were perhaps a contributing factor to the feeling I had that winter of never quite arriving, being carried along routes not completely of my own determination by forces not entirely in my control. I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to, I would like to play a little bit more of that, but um... Uh, this sound piece was accompanied by the physical exhibition um, with the presentation of new figurative work by Lee and sculptures from across the museum's collection. Um, together, they consider approaches the artists have shared over uh, thousands of years and question how instances of colonialism and cultural um, imperialism uh, seen in ancient Egypt, Greece, and Rome continue to frame um, contemporary uh, experience. Um, and lastly, um, and quickly, uh, bum, bum, bum. another person is Pablo Bronstein we work with. Um, similarly to Pablo Bron uh, similarly Pablo Bronstein used the digital publication to generate new works that expanded the absurdist and performative qualities within his installation. Um, this project, um, Bronstein used the galleries um, where his work was installed as a backdrop for a new video piece that he made. Um, our team worked with Pablo on site to film and choreograph gestures to draw um, our attention to and question the assumptions about specific objects in the collection. From there, Pablo brought um, this footage back to London with him and using it to choreograph a ballet score um, with dancers. Um, the final project culminated in a 30 minute video piece that um, Pablo is planning on touring to other museums. Um, again, this wasn't like a, a medium that Pablo ever really worked in before. I mean, the publication was an excuse to kind of expand. Um, I would like to show you that it's weird, really weird, experience it on your own. Um, so in conclusion, um, uh, keeping with our mission as a museum and an art school, the RISD Museum uh, looks for innovative ways in which digital projects can contribute to um, creative research and experimentation, as well as our particip participation in relevant and important conversation. Um, as museums um, have had to close physically due to COVID, um, we are challenged um, with engaging our audiences across new and varied platforms. Um, approaches to being critical and collaborative are um, um, ever evolving, expanding not only our methods, um, of content delivery, but also how we generate content, very important. Um, the projects initiated by Ziggurat um, allowed 
our artists to see new ways the museum can be relevant to their work and for the museum to greatly <clears throat> expand what it sees as both possible and valuable as it continues to shift its practice towards being a more diverse, inclusive, and equitable institution um, in the digital age. Um, interested in hearing your thoughts and in the Q&A. Um, if anyone's interested in learning more about Ziggurat, um, we're wanting to post like um, uh, our source code up on GitHub um, in the near future and encourage you to reach out. Uh, fantastic. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Um, and thank you both again, Jeremy and Joseph, for, for joining us today and for sharing those, those great publications and great initiatives. I'm, I've got a, a page full of notes that I'm taking. I'm, it's always nice to see. I'd, I'd seen these projects before. It's always nice to hear from the makers of these projects and the people most involved in them. 